Well, thank you very much, everybody, for um, attending today. So this is the fifth in our HDBI ethics seminar series. We have two great speakers, uh, um, Emily Jackson and Rosie Isassi. Uh, and so I'll introduce them in due course. And also my sincere thanks to Pilar for arranging this uh, seminar and, and, and making such a great job of, uh, of putting on these, these ethics seminars which I think we're all finding really useful. So um, basically we we realize that some of the topics that are discussed in these seminars can be contentious, people can have strong personal views on them. And so really we hope that we will be able to create an open, inclusive and safe environment during this, this next hour where everybody feels welcome and able to participate. And we really do encourage you to participate in this actively and we have plenty of time um, for questions and discussion. The way we'll do this is that both speakers will present in turn and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. And um, as Pilar has said in the chat, the, the talks themselves will be recorded, but the uh, Q&A will not be recorded. So everybody can feel free to say whatever they want. Um, please do feel free to write any uh, questions or comments in the chat at any point, and then we can pick them up during the discussion. Um, I think we have a Slido link. Uh, yeah, yeah, so that's also in the chat. So if you prefer to put your question anonymously there, uh, you can do that as well. So I think that's all I had to say as a sort of introductory remarks. Um, and so we can begin. Uh, so our first speaker, I'm very pleased to introduce um, Professor Emily Jackson. Uh, Emily is Professor of Law at the London School of Economics and her research interests are in the field of medical law. Um, she's served as a member of the BMA's Medical Ethics Committee uh, for quite a long period until quite recently. And in the period 2008 to 2012, she was deputy chair of the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, the HFEA. Uh, she's a judicial appointments commissioner, or she has been in the past. Um, she's currently fellow of the British Academy, and in 2017, she was awarded an OBE for services to higher education. So, Emily, thank you very much for speaking to us. Um, your title is Regulating Stem Cell Based Embryo Models. And please do share your screen. Thank you so much um, for that very uh, incredibly generous introduction. And thank you very, very much for inviting me. So um, I'm going to be focusing on UK regulation here. Um, I think Rosie's going to cover more the international um, dimension. So hopefully the two will fit fit together. So before saying anything about embryo models, I just thought I'd um, recap very briefly on um, what restrictions apply to research on embryos in the UK. Um, there's a very, very strict uh, regulatory scheme which has been in place um, in the UK since 1991. So you can't do research on embryos in the UK without a licence from the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority. Um, you also are not allowed to culture embryos in vitro um, after the formation of the primitive streak or 14 days, whichever happens sooner. So there's a very hard limit, primitive streak or 14 days. Um, the HFEA is only allowed to grant a license for embryo research if the research proposal is necessary or desirable for one of the statutory purposes. So it has to serve a particular uh, purpose, for example, um, to improve fertility treatment. It also must be necessary to use human embryos. So the HFEA couldn't grant a license uh, for research on embryos if you could do the result, do the same research using animals or existing cell lines. Um, one of the features of this regulatory, reg regulatory regime is quite how tough the sanctions are. So it's a crime to do any of these things without a, a license. And it's a crime to culture an embryo uh, in vitro for more than 15 years. 14 days. And the maximum penalty, which is some ways quite shocking, is 10 years in prison. I mean, nobody has gone to prison for 10 years in this case. In fact, I think one of the hallmarks of um, the regulation of embryo research in the UK is there's been very, very high levels of compliance. I think most people think it's very well regulated and the, the HFEA has a good handle on what's going on and, um, and control is there. 
Um, so that's uh, restrictions on embryos. But what about embryo models? Um, are they included in this incredibly intense regulatory regime? Well, if we look to the legislation to tell us whether they're included, it's actually not really very helpful. But the first section of the statute says in this act, embryo means a live human embryo. Now, as you probably completely obvious, all of you, that's a very weird definition because we don't usually use a word um, that we're trying to define in defining what it is. So just as a, a, an example, it would be like saying a table is a round wooden table. That doesn't tell you what a table is, it just tells you what type of table you're talking about. So the um, the highest court in um, the country, which was then at that point the House of Lords rather than the Supreme Court, it was faced with this question in a case about cloning um, at the beginning of this century. And its conclusion, which I think has to be the right one, is that the Act assumes we know what an embryo is. Um, therefore, embryo has its ordinary language meaning in law. Um, and on that basis, the basis that it has its ordinary language meaning, the HFEA's current working assumption is that embryo models are not embryos, and so they're not included. That means, aside from the rules that apply to stem cell research or other kind of human tissue research, research on embryo models is pretty much unregulated in the UK. Now, there is a mechanism within the statute for the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care to change that with regulations. Um, it, regulations could be passed to say that for the purposes of, of the Act, embryo models were included. But I'm not sure that that would be a helpful solution here. It would be a real sledgehammer of a solution. It would have an immediately chilling effect. All research would have to stop immediately um, while scientists applied for licenses. But it would also result in a hugely more restrictive environment for uh, research on embryo models than, it, than exists at the moment. So though there's a mechanism to bring them within regulation very quickly, I'm not sure anybody thinks using that would be a good idea. Now, some people have suggested that embryo models could replace um, embryos in research. And currently, something I mentioned just then, which is often described as a necessity principle, does mean that if you can't get a license to use embryos, if you could use something else, the statute therefore already contains an inbuilt statutory presumption that you should use embryo models if you can. So um, if you can use embryo models, um, you should. But I think everybody accepts that they're not, embryo models aren't going to replace um, embryos entirely, in part because you also need to validate embryo models in terms of seeing how they're developing. And to that end, I think lots of people think it might be a good idea to actually extend the 14 day uh, rule. But in addition, I think the argument that's sometimes made that we could have a kind of three R's approach to embryos in the same way as we do to animals, where we try to reduce their use, that that actually isn't necessarily a sensible thing to do, because what we know about IVF patients is that for lots of them, donating leftover embryos to research is really something they want to do. Um, and um, Kathy Nyken has spoken incredibly movingly about the length some patients go to to try to find a research project uh, as a home for their embryo. So it's not self-evident that discarding embryos um, is better than using them in research. The key difference, of course, as I'm sure you're all, all aware, is scale, that you could make millions of embryo models um, and that that enables um, things like high throughput toxicology testing, which would be impossible as well as illegal um, on, on human embryos. If we were to ask instead what the moral status of an embryo model is, what our obligations might be towards it, this is a complicated question as well. There are some people who have said, well, is there a point at which something is so much the same as something else that it becomes that something else? And obviously you could go around in circles with this sort of, um, this, this sort of discussion. But in trying to think about moral status, um, it might be worth trying to think about where the special moral status of the embryo comes from. Is it because it derives from human eggs and human sperm, or is it from its potential? Now, potential is quite a complex and confusing concept here, in part because IVF embryos don't have any potential at all unless they're gestated in a uterus for at least five months. But also, if you can make pluripotent stem cells, that rather disrupts 
any any arguments that you might have grounded in potential because anything has the potential to become anything else a skin cell can become um almost anything if we're instead interested in the question of whether it could implant we're in a bit of an impasse there as well because the research necessary to answer that question would be very dangerous and unethical and um, no one wants to carry out those sorts of experiments so i think in terms of what the potential of embryo models are is we we really really don't know so you can go around in circles about moral status and i think here at this point it's quite helpful to look back to the warnock report um which considered um groundbreaking at that point in the 80s a completely groundbreaking possibility of fertilizing an egg outside of a woman's body which was revolutionary in the 70s 60s 70s and 80s 70s obviously the first birth and warnock obviously reported in 1984 but the thing that i think is useful from warnock is that they they accepted they were dealing with similarly intractable questions about when life when personhood began and there was never going to be agreement on them. So the better approach, the simpler approach, was go straight to the practical question of how the embryo should be treated. So rather than think about what its status is, how, how do we, would we want an embryo model to be treated? Also, the other thing that I think is quite useful from Warnock is that although the Warnock Committee itself disagreed um, on the status of embryos, there was a dissenting minority opinion. There was one thing on which, which the Warnock report did agree, and that's that some legislation here is better than none, that there should be some limits that should not be crossed. Mary Warnock herself, I think, also recognised that regulation was not only needed in order to allay public concerns, but that actually it was also positively helpful for scientists to know where the boundaries are so that they can get on with their work. And it was very helpful for scientists for Parliament to be um, taking responsibility for deciding where those boundaries should lie. The Warnock Committee was also, I think, ahead of its time in recognising the need for public engagement in relation to novel scientific um, developments. And Anne McLaren, the incredibly influential developmental biologist who played an absolutely pivotal role on the Warnock Committee, she was interviewed um, by Jen Jane Denton shortly before she died. And, and I love her quote about just the more consultation, the better. She was all for pu public consultation. But also, I think what she's saying here is it's not public dialogue here is not just top down public education, telling people things. It's also genuine two way dialogue with the uh, with the public. At the same time, obviously, we must admit public understanding of embryo model research is currently pretty low. So it's also important to be able to explain clearly and accessibly what this research involves and what it hopes to achieve. And in doing so, it's important not to overpromise that the cure for miscarriage is imminent, but also to underpromise by making claims that um, embryo models could never um, develop um, into a full um, baby um, if, they, if they were to be carried to term, because we simply don't know the answer to those questions. We don't think they can from mice, but, but there were no certainties here. So there has been some public engagement published recently in relation to embryo models, which is incredibly interesting and helpful. And I think, um, predictably, perhaps, the public are surprised about the lack of regulation. They view governance as vital here and um, see the, the fact that actually what we need is legislation that voluntary codes of practice which we hope will that one will be out relatively soon are important but uh, legislation needs to follow up um, but also recognizing that that legislation shouldn't be impeding research by being too inflexible and the need for regulation to keep up to date to be regularly reviewed because obviously the science um, is moving very fast so if we think about how this sort of research should be regulated in the future well um, we do need a regulator here. The International Society for Stem Cell Research's guidelines suggest that there should be some sort of oversight, and we're currently not fulfilling that in the UK. And I think most people would agree that the HFEA is probably the appropriate regulator here. It's well respected, lots of experience of dealing with novel um, issues. I think an initial red line, I think, again, there's widespread agreement on would be that these shouldn't be put back into a uterus. And the Act, in fact, tries to accomplish that by saying you mustn't put back an embryo 
other than the permitted embryo, which is made with human eggs and human sperm. But of course, the form of words is a bit unfortunate because it says you mustn't place an embryo other than the permitted embryo. So if these things aren't embryos, are they covered by that prohibition? I think you would, so even though no scientists want to do this, I think this is a legal uh, loophole potentially that needs to be plugged. You would want a prohibition on putting them back into an animal host. And I think you would also want some kind of time or developmental limit. Now the 14 day limit doesn't work because embryo models don't develop in a linear way from day one, day two, day three, etc. You can jump forward and make an embryo that starts off at a, an embryo model that starts off at a later point. So ISSCR suggests minimum time necessary to do the research, which is helpful, but potentially infinitely expandable. So you might need to supplement that with some kind of developmental landmark. I think the statutory purposes that we have for embryo research would be too restrictive here. Um, and I think probably we don't need um, to have on the face of any legislation what the purposes should be. But I think it's an open question about whether there might be a preference or an obligation on scientists to use the least complex model necessary to, to do the research. Clearly you need consent from the tissue donor who provided uh, the original tissue for the stem cell. And again, open questions there about whether that consent needs to be specific or, or generic, whether generic or broad consent um, is appropriate. And finally, I think you'd need to decide what penalties should be appropriate. Would, a, would the sort of criminal penalties that attach to embryo research be appropriate? Well, possibly for putting back into a woman's body, but perhaps not for some other things. Final thing I just wanted to say really, really briefly is I really hope that uh, it's obviously not going to be this government that tackles this, probably the next one. I really hope it takes its time in far, insofar as there is time to produce properly well thought through um, legislation, because I think one real danger that we all need to be really aware of is that there's some scary headline followed by knee jerk legislation, which ends up um, imposing restrictions on research, which in the future, I hope will transform all of our lives. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Emily. That was uh, really nice and very thought provoking. I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions uh, in due course on what you've said, some of the different aspects. Okay, so now um, on to our second speaker, if I can just sort out my screen a little bit. Okay, um, so I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Rosie Isassi, who is Associate Professor of Human Genetics and Adjunct Professor of Law in, uh, in, in the John T. McDonald Foundation Department of Human Genetics at the University of Miami, Miller School of Medicine. Um, Rosie is uh, researching uh, various aspects of the social, ethical and policy dimensions of technologies, which she calls disruptive technologies. I hadn't really heard that term before, but, but uh, and by that she means technologies that, that challenge us, I guess, to change the way we do various things. So genomics, precision medicine, regenerative medicine are, are examples of that. Um, she, uh, Rosie, has uh, holds many leadership roles in uh, both nationally and internationally. So, for example, uh, she uh, is ethics policy advisor of the European Commission's uh, Euro European Human Pluripotent Stem Cell Registry. Uh, she's co-chair of the American Society of Human Genetics Professional Policy, Practice and Social Implications Committee. And she's a member of the Ethics and Policy Committee of the ISSCR, which uh, Emily has already mentioned, the International Society of Stem Cell Research. So, Rosie, thank you very much for agreeing to speak to us today. Um, the title of your talk is Charting the Governance of Stem Cell-Based Embryo Models. And so please take it away. Thank you. And Apollo, I will stop the video while I present it because I found myself distracted by looking at myself. <laughs> um, so I, I want to talk about the regulation of stem cell embryo models at both the international and national level. But the, let me start with some conceptual issues to just frame uh, the discussion. Um, there's a definition um, almost universally accepted of what is and what is not an stem cell based embryo model. It's not a human embryo, as Professor Jackson was explained to us, are these three-dimensional structures that derive from pluripotent stem cells. 
And the idea is that they will model, mimic, or recapitulate the developmental process that occurred in early human embryos. The different countries have adopted different criteria to further define what is an embryo and what is a stem cell embryo uh, a model may be. The ICCR new approach is, a non is uh, distinguishing between integrated and non-integrated stem cell models. The difference being whether they contain extra embryonic structures and or the ability to undergo further integrated development in vitro. So the more they can re really resemble and feel like and be like a real human embryo. Other countries uh, have looked at the potentiality criteria, so the potential to develop in a full a structured human embryo with all the extra layer ca characteristics. And others have looked at the developmental stage or the method of creation. Why this is important? Definitions, as Professor Jackson was saying, are the source of an entity legal status, but also they provide a moral or an ethical justification for the purpose which is that entity can be created, can be a study, can be used in research, and even in eventually clinical therapies. When we talk about the governance model, um, there's several approaches just want to remind the audience that there's not only the typical legislative approach where there's laws, regulations, there's also this important level of self-regulation, how professional guidelines, like the ones from ICCR and other entities and best practice, establish what are the golden standards for scientific and ethical integrity in conducting this type of research. Uh, there's international treaties and conventions, the European you know, has some of them not applicable yet to stem cell embryo models. And also, as, as, as you know, from the UK example and others, sometimes precedent jurisprudence can fill those uh, gaps in legislative or in the governance approaches. Um, another terminology that I want to clear, when I talk about a governance and oversight, governance, what we are talking about is that the HFA is an, the, an entity that has the authority to provide oversight, to actually to uh, make individuals accountable through respecting set of rules. An oversight is this level of regulatory supervision that has twofold purposes say up the rights and the welfare of research participants or their interests, um, such as uh, donors of embryos or somatic tissues, but also to ensure that research is conducted with ethical integrity. Now, let me navigate you to the International Society for Stem Cell Research and the guidelines. They are based in two premises, scientific integrity and is interpreted in the principle of transparency and integrity of the research enterprise. And the second one is ethical integrity. This is respect for patients and research subjects, put the, their welfare first, but also be, attend to social and distributed justice issues that may arise and, as a course of research. The guidelines for the conduct of human embryonic stem cell research have evolved over time trying to keep pace with scientific developments. The early ones, very embryocentric, given the time in 2016. In a, um, 2016, uh, 2006, I'm sorry, 10 years later, with the scientific developments, it starts the guidelines addressing stem cell embryo models. At that time, they were calling embryonic-like structures. And they were trying to establish with the guidelines a pathway for oversight, for the assembly, the differentiation, the aggregation of cell populations in a manner that mimic or recapitulates key stages of embryonic development. And this is important. They talk about key stages. But overall, they talk about this human organismal potential, this potentiality criteria. What happened? Six years later, um, and I was part of the ISSCR uh, guidelines committee uh, revisions, we realized that the potentiality criterion, whether it's sound in a theoretical basis, is very impractical in, because it cannot be measured or validated for stem cell-based embryo models due to ethical concerns and gapic knowledge about embryonic development. So the criterion became being useless for regulatory purposes, right? If we cannot um, culture an embryo beyond the 14 days, if we cannot mimic embryonic stem cell embryo models beyond that task, 
it will be very difficult to even assert what they're like. I uh, just wanted to remind what the guidelines, what they meant to be, is to pro provide this golden uh, best practice or these standards that are aimed to be reconciled or harmonized with national law. Scientific and ethical rigor, independent oversight, transparency are at the core, one of the core values. And an aspect that is very important is the highlights how scientific and meritorious uh, purposes for novel stem cell research projects and different levels of oversight, which I will address. Um, in terms of the regulation on stem cell embryo models, um, this is an statement in June 2023 as a reaction of, of many scientific developments that were headline news and just reiterates what the Gallant said there's distinction between integrated and non-integrated embryo models and just calling into attention that the basic criterion is that it has to be a compelling scientific rationale, that it has to be a careful review by a specialized oversight process, and a call for scientists to maintain in culture these entities for the minimal necessary time to achieve the scientific objective. And of course, this opens to many questions. The guidance rate rate that is prohibited from transfer of any embryo model to the uterus of a human or an animal. So when we talk about oversight, what are the guidelines, the new revision of the guidelines establish? They establish different categories of oversight depending on the type of science and the ethical and um, issues that arise. Uh, in the category one are those experiments that are reportable to an oversight body, but are not typical review or call for a specialized oversight process. And here we have not integrated stem cell embryo models. So they have to go a level of ethical and scientific review, but it doesn't call for this extra layer. If we move to category two, and this uh, categorization is new in the 2021 guidelines, it, it just creates another layer of protection for scientific and ethical integrity. And most here, integrated stem cell embryo models. Finally, the third category uh, is divided in two. And almost you can criticize that it might be a, a fourth, 3B might be a fourth category. What it means is that research that in 3A, that it could, there's a scientific rationale for conducting this type of research, but it's currently deemed unsafe by the scientific community. Um, and also there's a level of ethical sensitivity about the research. And 3B is a category that is prohibited. It's not allowed because it lacks this compelling scientific rationale, but it's also very ethical concerning. And here is where gestating human stem cell embryo models, whether in human and animals is, is I must um, mention to you that all the regulation about stem cell embryo models establishing the guidelines are now being reviewed. I'm part of a working group committee that are trying to revise the guideline because scientific developments have happened so fast in the last three years that we feel we are talking collectively as all the members of the SCR that doesn't longer reflect the state of the science and also that we can do a better job in explaining how the, this complex different varieties of stem cell embryo models will fit better with these categories. Um, when I talk about a specialized oversight, when the guidelines refer, because it, when it mean, people said, well, what it means by your specialized oversight? Uh, what it means is just basically seek criteria that they have to be First of all, the project might include uh, must include scientific rationale. What is the merit of a research proposal? And they have to be relevant expertise of the researchers. So here the guidelines call for researchers that will be capable of evaluating this complex, unique aspects of this science, but also to have enough knowledge and be attentive to the associated ethical issues. Uh, you might be familiar in embryo research policies also that always are uh, this criteria that uh, it has to be a, a lack of a justified alternative, have to be ethical and legal permissible, and they have to be a strong justification for research. 
when we talk about how this oversight process look like, uh, how an oversight body must be must be composed or integrated, it calls the guidelines for membership to be highly multidisciplinary with scientists, ethicists, legal and regulatory experts, but very importantly, it also calls for community members who are not necessarily directly engaged in the research and the consideration. So this, the, the, the wisdom of society reflected here, of the public. The updated guidelines also uh, provide some more flexibility in terms of how these requirements or this calls for uh, uh, special oversight be harmonized with ethical, uh, for legal norms. I want to quickly talk about another aspect that is also germane about the creation and regulation and stem cell embryo models that Professor Jack also mentioned, which is how we culture those human embryos. And one of the guidelines that is provocatively called to extend in the 14-day limit rule of culturing embryos in, in vitro, and, and to say, well, maybe that limit, it was too arbitrary and it could might, might be extended if there's a, be a robust process for governance and a specialized oversight with the criteria that I mentioned before, the scientific justification, this an ethical merit. And finally, uh, an, another important aspect of the guidelines that is reminds scientists, reminds the whole scientific community and us that public dialogue is essential. And then establish a new recommendation to encourage public dialogue, not only beyond uh, issues of how to culture embryos between the 14 day rule, but also to engage them as truly participatory in creating these governance structures. Uh, the last part of my presentation, I just want to give you uh, just a, a quick overview of flesh out how that it looks like, how stems embryo models or embryos are defined, are subject to oversight, and, and, and how there's a level of permissibility in the countries. I'm not going to in detail, but I'm just going to post a, a publication we have um, some years ago. Uh, and would you look at just a sample of countries that cross the spectrum for very restricted approaches to stem cell and embryo research, particularly to very liberal. And we just look at how the criteria of potentiality of embryo developmental stages and others uh, were included, and how uh, also, according to Professor Jackson, how in many countries there's this loophole and, and this uncertainty of where stem cell embryos fit within the existing regulatory framework. So it, it had got by surprise uh, to many regulators to see that, well, these are embryo-like entities, but they're not embryos and should never be treated as an embryo uh, unless we go to very complex integrated uh, stem cell embryo models. And, and then these regulatory gaps raise concerns about the, uh, um, giving proper governance and oversight and respecting also societal, moral, and ethical perspectives of how we should look at how we should regulate these uh, entities. So I'm going to stop share here and just acknowledge uh, my institution and contributions. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm trying to put my camera back. Okay. Thank you very much, Rosie, for a very interesting talk. Uh, so I think we've had two really great um, presentations, very complementary to each other, raising lots of extremely difficult issues, uh, but ones that I know many of us on this call are involved with in some way or another.